Miss uh, Keith, I will turn it over to you all. Are we live? Hopefully everybody's there. Appreciate everybody coming and uh, joining and, and glad to be here. Like I said, uh, I must have done well. Um, I, uh, Dave told me I was working for food and tonight I went to his house and looked at the farm and got fed real well. So I think he's expecting a little better effort tonight than what we had last time. But uh, uh, I think that the crowd we had here enjoyed it, but uh, they were looking for, instead of for snacks, they were looking for some ibuprofen or Tylenol. Uh, for their headaches that they, they, they've taken in. Uh, hopefully tonight we can, if you looked at the topic, it's a broad topic, and we've covered a lot of things already that are specific in the form of taxes and then uh, estate planning documents and trusts. Well, tonight uh, we're going to get my little clicker going. Is it not wanting to go? Do I need to hit it? There we go. Let's try back up. There we go. There we go. Yeah. So tonight it's more about people. It's not as much, it's somewhat about the money and the assets, but a lot of it is about the people and who's involved in the in the family farm situation and how do we how to achieve the goals that we're looking for. And the hard part is every family is different. A few of the names are changed to protect the guilty, but they're a little, generally they're a little, there's something different in every family. So just because you know somebody that's done something one way, that doesn't mean it's right or it's wrong for you. It, it, but it's a good place to start with kind of with something that you've seen work or heard that has worked. But how do we create a succession plan? And that's a little different than an estate plan where an estate plan says, I've got a will and, you know, uh, everything to my loving spouse. And if, if they predecease me to my children, share and share alike. Had a family of 60 something year olds and said, whoever that lawyer that wrote mom of the will, he was a fool. We never shared our lives and we're never going to share now. <laughs> so I has, had to ask them, I'm going to charge more. They said, fine, because we're going to fight for it. So if you want to save money, don't fight. But the real issue in saving and in, in not fighting is if mom and dad and the family can all develop a plan that achieves their goal. And every family's goal might not be the same, probably shouldn't be. So what we got to look at is how does it, it this, the, the planning, it overlaps where you've got a state planning and we talked about business planning at the very beginning meeting some, we were doing tax talk, but then it's the succession plan. That's a different thing. The estate plan is when you, you're gone or prior to your death, your health care. But then you've got the business plan of how do I develop a business that's being profitable or at least doing the things I want it to do. But now in succession planning is who's going to run this business? Can they run this business? Is the business even worth running? Or is it just an overgrown hobby or sometimes we call it an overgrown <laughs> FFA project? So if you've got a family involved and that's generally what we're talking about is we're succession on to a family member. Sometimes I have families that have no, uh, a couple that has no children, but they want to see the farm, a farm. Well, sometimes we call it the lucky neighbor kid or the lucky grandson-in-law. They seem to come in pretty good because son and daughter are 60 and they're not gonna give up the seniority at the plant or the job or career. So that lucky grandson-in-law or, or granddaughter may be the one that gets to do the farming. <clears throat> so when, if you've got, you're trying to figure out if your child, if you're gonna bring them into the business, don't wait till you die. Because then that, that kind of is, like uh, just walking down the street and asking somebody to run your farm. You know, are they trained? Do they, can they, do, do they even know what the job description is? Uh, is their resume worth hiring them or passing the farm on to them? I've, I know quite a few kids that are 60 now that, that when mom went to the nursing home, they had to learn to balance a checkbook. Now, is that child ready to run the farm? 
Hopefully he, he or she has a good spouse that does know how to balance a checkbook. But it, it's in the, the farm, in the farming business, the child in the farming business, you know, did they start out with this over this 4-H or FFA project that's kind of overgrown? Have they accumulated some uh, livestock or pro, uh, uh, equipment, or maybe even they bought land already? Are they working their own business and they're going to gradually acquire mom and dads when they're ready to retire? One thing that we have, though, that's different in our ag society is uh, you, you know, it's kind of like Charlton Heston told the in that NRA speech when he held the gun and said that politicians can take it out of his cold, dead hand. That's usually the John Deere keys. And, uh, you know, we, in Henry County, we raised a lot of tobacco, and we always, the, the story was when the 70 year old walked out of the funeral home, when the 93 year old daddy died, the 70 year old said, This year I get to drive the tobacco setter. Or I get to drive the square baler because, you know, that was the skill position. Well, a little late for Junior to learn how to drive that thing because now he don't have one at all. They don't have a square baler. So in our, or we have another situation where parents are loaning the machinery to the child to get them started. And over time, is there going to be a transition? Well, is there a transition of asset ownership? Is there a transition of management decision making? You know, Junior may go to the bank. His daddy drives him over there to get a loan, his beginning farmer loan to buy equipment, so Junior can go work at the plant while Daddy can drive his new tractor. That happens. Uh, and if Junior's fine with that, all that's good and fine. But uh, when you've got three other sisters or brothers. Things get iffy. Whose tractor was that? I think it was daddy's. You got any proof? So, you know, it's, uh, it becomes that you're, you're grown ups now. You're in a business, you're partners. This is about business. You, you're dealing with family, but you got those non farming family members to also deal with. So, if the child's coming in, maybe a lot of good families that I've worked with when the dad finally turns over those keys and he rents the equipment to the kid, he leases the ground to the kid and dad now has income. He might not have had income for a while or net income, but now he has some, but the, the kid can start doing some farming, uh, maybe on a little better terms than maybe the bank would do, but he's also gaining some experience. Sometimes these things occur not with a plan, but when dad has a stroke or a, a vehicle or a tractor accident and can't get out on the ground on the farm anymore, and they're forced to do something. But are we going to do it as a formal business and have actually a partnership or an LLC or another corporate in, or business entity form? Well, we're grown ups and we're business partners. We need to, you know, if, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, we better make it be a duck. Let's get an LLC or partnership in writing so we, Junior doesn't have to prove to the brothers and sisters that's his equipment. They thought Daddy had it because as a tractor, Daddy, they learned to drive on, but Daddy sold it to me. You know, do we have, you know, you do you when he dies and and. The oldest child was named in the old will that was written 35 years, 40 years ago. And that's the kid that hadn't been on the farm in 40 years. And, and he thinks that was dad's tractor. He doesn't realize what all is going on. A lot of times I have to do a lot of educational uh, seminars with the families, the non-family kids about, uh, uh, and they usually have to get out mom, daddy's tax returns and show them what's happened over time. So you, you need to see what is your situation you're really wanting to do. If you're bringing them into the business, uh, are you easing them in as a partner? Are you easing them in as they're the actual operator? And you're, uh, my dad, I was lucky. Uh, he did reside, he, he was a teacher and school teacher and he farmed, we farmed a lot. We were raising 20 acres of tobacco and had about 
40 registered Charolais cows and about 70 acres of hay. And he ran a custom hay baling business, did two or 3,000 round bales a year for a long time. And uh, one day he said, well, I'm just going to sell it to you. I said, well, that, ought, that sounds pretty good, but how much am I going to have to pay? Well, we figured it out. And, and, uh, but I said, well, he thought it was the best day of his life because he said, when, when I was seven, eight, and nine, and I was out driving bush hog or tractor or mower, or if I tore something up, he had to pay for it. Now it's his turn. I, I had to, my job was to hook everything up and fix everything. Or he would take it and get it fixed and have them send me the bill. So he, his retirement was uh, from teaching and then farming was involved was, I said, he had a few things he had to do. He had to go to the mailbox and get his retirement check. He had to keep mom happy. He had to play with the grandkids. And I said, if you want a bush hog, let me know and I'll have it hooked up. If you want to go play golf, go play golf. But if you want to come back in the evening and bush hog for a couple hours, that's time I don't have to. Well, he kind of liked that idea, especially when I had to buy the fuel and everything else that went with it. So he got the joy of farming. Uh, but now he didn't, he didn't get paid a lot, but uh, he knew that going in, but it was a, it was a good transition, but I had been working with the farm at my way into it. And hopefully with a degree in animal science, a minor in ag economics, farm management, a minor in agronomy, and I'd gone to law school and I'd farm for a while. Hopefully he thought I could handle it. And maybe I did, maybe I didn't, but we still, we're still playing on the farm. But are we working with the family? Are we working with maybe the kid is expanding the operation by renting neighbor's land that dad wasn't renting? Maybe there's a retired farmer getting out that land could be picked up, pasture or cropland or whatever. But the question usually involves around, is the pie big enough? When you're cutting up the pie of the business, is it big enough? Do we have enough profit to bring in a kid? Well, if we're barely making a living for mom and dad, how are we going to bring in a kid? Well, we better be either expanding an existing uh, enterprise or we need to add something different to the additional what, what we're actually doing is we've got to make the pie big enough for everybody to get a piece to eat on. If not, I hope you married will. So we, we got to look at what are you really trying to do uh, that this rent of land and a hidden gift, well, is it really given to you or were you supposed to pay for it and can't pay for it? Well, then is daddy subsidizing or mama subsidizing the kid's unprofitable hobby? If that's okay with everybody and everybody can afford it, that's wonderful. That's a lifestyle we all enjoy. But be honest with yourself and your family about what are we really doing uh, and then try to make it work. If we're going to do it as a business, and if you want to, the real issue is if you want to deduct it on your taxes, you better be walking like the duck that's a business. Because if not, they're going to, if you get audited, they're, they're going to deny you, and you're going to be paying a lot of penalties, interest, and you're not going to be buying that tractor or that truck just because the tax man said you need to because you don't want to pay any taxes. But isn't paying taxes a sign of making money? Different perspective. So in the different business enterprises, are we just operating as dad as a sole proprietorship, a single business? Is mom or a widow or is, are we combining? Are you gonna make a general partnership? Are mom and dad already partners to start with? Are we gonna do a limited partnership? We're starting to get complicated. Or is it a limited liability company, which really is just a partnership with some added perks? You don't see, most of the time, you'll, the partnerships are unwritten partnerships that just happen to fall into place and never did, weren't run real well usually for tax reasons. The limited liability company shows the IRS you're making an effort to do it right. You've got bank or checking account that's business account, not personal and business, and you're running your assets and expenses as a business. 
a limited partnership or a limited liability partnership, that can work well also with the limited liability company if you have some non-farm heirs that are kind of silent partners, so to speak. Uh, S corporations, uh, I haven't done a C corporation in 30 years and right now nobody here should do one either for what we're talking about. Uh, a cooperative, that can be a good thing or a limited liability company where a couple of uh, far, uh, farms or families get together and buy a piece of equipment and share in it and and because they're not all going to use it every day, but you know, does everybody have to have an aluminum 24 foot trailer that they use three days a year? Does everybody have to have a round baler? In the seventies, my dad made a nice little side living in the summer and the, when he wasn't teaching, round baling hay all over the place. I said two or three thousand bales a year. Well, he could afford to get a new round baler every two years. And it, it was pretty nice to get that newer Vermeer, but now everybody's got to have one. You need to look at, or my, do I run enough hay? If you're not bailing about 80 to 100 plus acres of pretty good hay, do I really justify hay equipment? Or do I have it because I don't want to pay taxes and I'd rather have toys and I like to do it when I want to do it. If you can afford that and that fits, okay, that's fine. But does it really work for you? Are you really in there for a profit? Farming can be profitable, but it's always hard and it's still hard now. But it's hard in how do you think about it? Not so much always the work. My wife really wanted, she said if I, she could, get, if I could get her a zero turn mower and a uh, tractor with a loader or a skid steer, she'd be a complete woman. I knew I'd married well. But if you were at the first meeting, I did travel three states, or three years, 28 states a year, 270 nights a year. Everybody thought I was buying and selling registered cattle and showing cattle. I was really on a nationwide search for the perfect woman. It's been 32 years. I've, I've still got her fooled. But the other day, uh, we were talking about this uh, last year, and uh, she said something about that skid steer. Well, she looked up, uh, I did some racing. <laughs> cost of one and then she said well you know the hardware uh, lumber yard down the roads now that they've got a skid steer and too many excavators and they deliver so we make her happy and we rent that skid steer two or three times a year if she wants it if my son's there he has to fork them in there now. so sometimes you got to think a little bit outside the box but the important thing was she's still there all right, uh, selecting this business entity, if you're really getting into it and you're really going to do it right with this business, you want to keep your tax deductibility, you want to hopefully be profitable, doesn't mean you are. One thing in the, when the tax issue thing along this business entity, the IRS kind of has this unwritten rule. Farmers will always be able to deduct a Schedule F expense if they're producing something we'll eat. So that's why the ostriches and the emus never really took off. The, the llamas had problems. Nobody wanted to eat them. either too ugly or too cute. But the, if, if you're producing beef cattle, you can lose money for a long time. They don't care as long as you're putting cheap food out there for the city people to buy. Uh, goats, we raise meat, boar meat goats. Oh, as long as you can eat them, they're pretty much tax deductible. Not much questions asked. Uh, you know, it's, it's the, what is the IRS doing? Well, what the real issue is, they know with, that they want, with less than 1%, or I know it's less than 2%, it's near 1% of the population of the United States actually works in production agriculture. So 99% of the people, what do they really want? Safe, cheap food. That's good. And if the government can do that in any way to encourage that, and they know farmers in uh, the Depression would produce agricultural products to the point of bankruptcy uh, or death. If they'll keep doing it, let's just give them a break. And as long as we can keep them just profitable enough for some of them to be profitable and let them deduct it, they'll keep producing food. Because farming is an addiction. If you weren't here the first session, you know, so what is it we got to say? 
Yes, I'm addicted. Okay. It, it's, it's a good thing, but it is an addiction. It's stuff we do. I've got friends that can't understand. I never, I, they don't think I ever take a vacation. But if I go next week to the Beef Expo, I'm having a great time. I'm also seeing a lot of old friends and a lot of clients and a lot of potential clients where they're, if they're a lawyer, they wouldn't understand that. But you've got to consider this lifestyle part, just like what I do. I want to serve the people that I, I like. The farmer, almost all my clients are farmers. Do you want to produce something? Do you not like to do the marketing? Sometimes the marketing is the hardest part. And if you're not a people marketing person, it's a horrible thing to try to do. But maybe the marketing person isn't, doesn't really want to go out there in the middle of the night and take care of that animal or before the frost gets certain vegetables. You got to see what you want to do. But if you're going to join this as a business, you got to look at income taxes, uh, FICA and employment taxes. If you're offering any employees, you have benefits. Also these liquidation costs, that's where the real problem with C corporations were a big deal in agriculture in the 60s and early 70s. And then in the early 80s, a lot of things changed. And if you were hung up in a C corporation in agriculture, you could get hit pretty hard when you quit or when you sold out. That's why you don't see many C corporations in agriculture anymore. Um, there are some different advantages for discounting for tax purposes with agricultural businesses. In selecting the entity, are, you, are we looking to create the business and then sell it as an ongoing business? Are we gonna liquidate it? Are we gonna transfer it to a family member? Or what are we, are we the continuity and transfer, transferability? Uh, one big, if, you're, if you are a large farm where there are FSA payment limitations, uh, that if you're a large enough grain farm in the state of Kentucky, 20 years ago, one of my clients was the first grain farm that ever hit a payment limitation. And now they own 17,000 acres. Back then they were just farming 15,000. So they could not operate their, their business as a partnership or as an LLC. They had to be a partnership. That way they could have multiple payment limitations. But again, 99% of us aren't going to have to worry about that. But if you're of much size or you intend to grow to a larger size, you may need to address that now because it's easier to hit those limits. Are we going to have one manager, multiple managers? Are we going to arm wrestle to see who wins the manager hat today? Uh, are we going to hire employees? Are the owners, what's the liability? Does one of the kids want to be an owner and come out and hunt, bring his buddies for the big dove hunt or the, or the deer hunt, but they really don't want to be involved in day-to-day decision-making or labor activities? So what do you really want to do? What are you really trying to do? So Again, there's many things that could work. It's what fits your family, your situation. So when we get in these strategies to figure out how we're going to organize the business, almost most farms are sole proprietorships or partners, they're single entities. Husband and wife, one person. Are we going to get into multiple entities where a lot of lots of times we're dealing with the real estate will be in an LLC. The operating company will be in a different entity. So like the land, we might have mom and dad own the LLC that owns the land. And then the LLC that operates it up here is the operating company. That in might include some of the kids that are involved. And then we may end up with the kids buy land and that's in another, but it's all leased to the operating company. And over time, mom and dad just become landlords and lease it up to the kids and maybe gift or sell the entity that's the operating company. So there's different ways to structure it. Lots of times it's a cash flow question. Maybe it's to provide income to mom and dad to where they start out being involved in the operating business, but then they, they evolve out to where they're just renting their land or renting their equipment 
until such time that the equipment gets traded and all the new equipment is bought by the kids. You know, you, you'd get a 70-year-old and, and it's not been to the farm machinery show lately and go price last week a combine. Or a, not just a combine, a subcompact John Deere four-wheel drive with a loader and, it's, and a, uh, a backhoe. The backhoe's about that wide. You know, it is it, the amazing of what the equipment has evolved to, but the cost of it is pretty amazing if you haven't been with it following it. A sticker shock can cause a lot of rifts between mom, a dad and son on the way back home from the farm machinery show. Kid needs it, wants it, got to have it. Daddy's going, no, 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 no. He remembers variable interest rates and paying 21% in 1978 or 1980. Kids never seen anything above 4%. What do they know? I guess I'm getting old like David here. The operational entity that we're choosing, again, there's these different operational options. And just because somebody does it doesn't mean you should, because that LLC, you see LLCs a lot. A lot of times we'll have an LLC for the land, LLC for the operating company, an LLC for the trucking company, an LLC for the livestock company. It's all about isolating liability, but also, an LLC can be the same as a single member, a husband and wife, or it can be an uh, Ashland Oil Company. It could be an LLC can be everything from single member to actually a corporate C structure type thing inside of an LLC. And choosing this entity, things that you are going to have in different entities or the same entity is you better have that LLC or the farm business checkbook. The IRA, I'm sure your tax repairs always gotten on you, is <clears throat> if you're running a Schedule F, even if it's part-time, you need to have a farm checkbook and show that this is personal and this is the farm. Uh, we were talking about it at supper the night about what about the deductibility of cat food? Now, at our house, our farm, we have three cats and three dogs. The, the three dogs are great Pyrenees, and they've never been away from the goats in their life. They've never been off the farm in their life. And you don't pet them a lot, but they are trying to be a little friendly, except if, you, if I go in with a different hat on, they get upset. But now these dogs, they're pure business. And you can tell by looking at them, I don't brush them and comb them like some of these show Great Pyrenees. Now the cats, these my son calls them certified barn cats. We buy them from a special breeder. This kid, a friend of ours that sells this feed, he, he, his son raises certified barn cats. Well, these cats are fully clawed. They live in the barn. And their activities are to be there to eat the rats, the mice and the birds. And it's amazing how many of those birds they can get before they drown in the water bucket. I don't know why they do that. But because that cat is not petted often, never leaves the farm, is it tax deductible? Well, sure it is. I'll argue with any IRS agent that it is. But now if he really lived half time at the house and he walked to the barn and he was declawed and he had a little perfume sprayed on him occasionally, that's probably not a certified barn cat. So just because it's a cat doesn't mean it's tax deductible. It might be. What's the, what's the lawyer answer if you've been watching from the earlier seminars? Well, got to say it, well, it depends. You know, is that cat trained prior to certification? You know, is the government agency involved? All right, so the, what are you doing with the business? Are you borrowing equipment? Are you leasing equipment? Are the livestock? Uh, how that's placed in the entity is depending upon which entity you're doing or are you just doing one? Well, the main issue is, is the asset in, in actively used in the business. Then it needs to be into that farm checkbook under that farm tax return. Uh, land holding, 
again, that's where you're, the land owner might be also active in the operational entity, but over time, his activities may decrease. Now, he may still be involved, mom or dad might be involved in management, but they're not out there in labor as much. Well, that doesn't mean they're still not an active member, but at some point, they may get out of the operating business entirely, but they still could be the landowner. Uh, heirs, not in the business. The, the poor, unfortunate kid that didn't get addicted to farming. I've got three sisters. They love the farm. They grew up on the farm. They couldn't find the boundaries of our farm if they had to. They know where the driveway is. They know where the tobacco barn is and the stripping room because they grew up doing it. And they want their kids to be a part of it. But really, it's hard to explain to them. They can't just turn their... Now, my cousin and I roamed probably a 1,000 acres of all our neighbor's property when we were six and seven years old. But we were fully trained by my grandfather, right, when we were five as to what we should or shouldn't do. Some of my nephews and nieces are teenagers, and it's a dangerous world down there in that barn. You know, if they leave the wrong gate open, if they touch the wrong switch, don't lick your hands if you touch the wrong something. But how are we going to deal with these kids that they're, it's not their fault they didn't get addicted? My sisters love my parents, and I know that, but they didn't have that addiction. So how do we be fair to the non-addicted? Well, one of the answers is fair isn't always equal, and equal isn't always fair. Pretty deep, about that far. But you know, it's, it's, it all depends on how, who's looking at it from what perspective. But one thing is, it's not really a wise move to have your non-farming heirs involved in the day-to-day -day business because they might not understand the process the timing of the expense, the seasonality of the, of the activity. So decision-making probably better stay involved with the people that are actually uh, risking the money, but also have some knowledge. And if they don't have the knowledge, they don't need to be making uh, management decisions anyway. We need to be training them. How often are you gonna distribute any income? If you don't distribute an income very often, those non-farming heirs kind of would like to see the, the money flowing. You know, they, they, they look at it as an investment. We're looking at maybe sometimes as a long-term investment lifestyle, and they don't understand that. They think it's like a, a mutual fund that makes dividends. Uh, looking at these other different activities and things is what does that kid, the non-farming kid, really want to be involved? Is there enough cash assets to offset the farm assets? One issue is a problem is some families say, well, I've got, I've got uh, $500,000 in uh, cash investments in stock. That'll go to these non -farming, this non-farming kid, and the farm saves $500,000 of assets that's gonna to go to the farming kid. That's fine when they're 70, but what happens when they're 89 and they've been liquidating some of that stock to pay for their health care, And they've been eating this up and now the, the non-farming kid is gonna get less than half of what the farming can get. Is that fair? Maybe, is it equal? No. There's ways we can work with that uh, by in there and inherit how, what is it saying underneath there? How to treat the non-farm, off-farm kids. That's what it's saying. Uh, maybe it's in the, it actually in the inheritance and the will or when the time comes, you know, don't kill me off yet, I'm not dead. Don't just circle around, you know, come and talk to me. Uh, but it might be in the inheritance of the opera, of the farmland. The kid that's farming might have an option to buy for a certified appraised price 
Well, that's fair. And then it's equal because each of the kids get 50% of that certified appraised price. But the kid that's farming is going to inherit half of it. Hopefully, he might be able to borrow the other half to buy out the, the sibling, but he doesn't have to bid against the world. You know, because of the developer, the banker, the lawyer, the doctor, the insurance person, you know, usually we call them farm boys went away, done good in some other enterprise. Now they want to come back and buy a farm. Uh, and they don't want 10 acres. But you, you can have a balance of fair and equal as long as you can explain it to those kids. Uh, again, sometimes that kid that's, the plan sounds good when the mom's 70 and the kid's 50, but when the mom's 90 and the kid's 70, he's not actively, he's having trouble getting his boots on, let alone getting out there and actively farming we maybe need to be talking about the next generation that might want to come in and actively farm. They're the 50 year old now. So uh, analyzing who the players are, you might use life insurance where the life insurance policy will go to the non-farming kid and the farming kid gets the farm assets. I've had uh, uh, some situations where the farming kid actually pays the premium on the partner dad when he if he got the premium started early enough so when dad dies this kid has money to buy out his sister that's how we use life insurance uh how we use retirement plans again maybe that goes to the non-farming kid the non-farm assets might balance out the farm assets again if they're not eaten up by health care uh how do you get the acquiring the interest in the farm real estate you might do something with, with gifting in conjunction with a sale. Because let's say, okay, I'm going to give you your half now, but you've got to buy out your sister now. And I'm going to live off the retirement, and you're going to let me live here, and I'm going to watch go fishing every day. You know, it's what, what is the family needs and how are they, how are they filled. Uh, again, these non-farm heirs, uh, Equal distribution of asset value may not, may not always be the same. They may not see that the value is, uh, had a family that uh, one son-in-law, there's usually an in-law somewhere that's watched a, that's a real estate wizard and thinks that all the land's worth 15,000 an acre because so-and-so said so. But if it's sold for more than a couple of thousand at best, the kid might not make, be, may, make it on the farm. But if he, get, if he got it at uh, 2,000 an acre, what to say in two years, he doesn't sell it for 10,000 an acre. There are some, there are some issues there. Uh, we'll get into ways to work with that. Uh, how we receive the real estate can affect the ability for that kid to keep farming. Uh, getting... We put the children together as tenants in common. We're, from that earlier episode we had here, talked about tenants in common or tenants with or joint tenants with right of survivorship. If tenants in common on a D, that means they're 50 50 partners. Or if there's three of them, they're one third partners. Now you've placed the farming child in the partnership with the non farming child. I've seen that work in the non-farming kid say, that's great. Don't ask me for any money. You just keep farming. You pay all the property taxes and insurance. I'll still own half when the day is done. And they work out something. Well, but if that, that joint decision-making, there's two of them, now they tie. One says sell and one says keep. When somebody drives down the road and says, I want to buy your farm, how much you sell it for? I get people, I, I've had people in the last two weeks calling me, asking me to sell land that are, is either I own it or it's clients of mine own it. They're just, we'll make you a cash offer today. I guess they're waiting to find somebody that desperately wants to sell farmland. Um, Make sure you got, if you're going to do it, you have some sort of buy sell agreement in the deed or in the will or in the partnership 
so that you know that, that you don't have to bid against the world? Or how are we going to determine a price? You know, the worst thing is you, you put it in the two kids' names, or if they, the kids inherit it, and one of them says, no, it's worth 15000 an acre. I know what it is. And then he ends up taking his brother to court and selling it at the courthouse door or a forced sale and paying all the commission and all the costs and all that just because somebody told him something. Wasn't a certified appraiser, but he thought they were right. Transferring assets uh, in the farming transition or succession, there's certain strategies where gifting assets to heirs, or I mean, to farming heirs or non-farming heirs, maybe you gift money to the non-farming heirs and you give farm assets to the farming heir. You know, because they're addicted and you gave money, they're just gonna spend it on farm stuff, right? You know, that's like all other addicts. So uh, why not work that out? Well, that may be something that works in your family situation is uh, you're giving something to each one of them annually or however. Some grandmas call that bait to get their kids and grandkids to come to Christmas because they think they're going to get a check. I always went for the food, didn't you, Dave? I, that's what I, I went for, but you know, some people, I guess, gave checks away. Uh, how you sell the, the strategy of transferring this, when uh, some of the best farm deals I've ever worked with families was we broke things up with the, the residents, we deeded it off separate, where we had the farm real estate where dad's ready to retire. And he just wants to drive tractor for fun now and tear things up for the kids to fix. So they we'd cut off the house. Well, we do a long-term sale on the real estate. Well, what if the kid's not ready to buy? I had one dad said, all I want is X number of dollars a year. You figure out how to make it work. Well, what we ended up doing was for the first five years, they leased the farm. Mom, dad kept the house and maintained it. That way you didn't have the daughters-in-law fooling with mama's house. Don't want that. If you ever want to go back for Christmas for that food. So you'd have the real estate the farm real estate, well, we leased it for five years. The farm machinery, they leased it because a lot of it was old and was on the way to being traded or, or junked. So some of the boys had, the two boys that were farmers, they had some of their own equipment. So they just leased dads, leased the land, but they bought the cattle because Cattle banks don't like to loan money for livestock. They like to own, loan money for land. Land doesn't run away or die. So bankers like land. So what we did was we said, okay, we'll do the, the livestock as a purchase to the kids. In the first five years, it was a dairy and they had some beef herd too. They bought the livestock. But again, daddy only wanted X number of dollars. So we said, okay, this component makes up this much money. This component makes up this much money. This over here, daddy's going, oh, great, I got my money. Well, the boys were happy because they could ease into it. Then dad, uh, they, they, after the five years, they, they appraised what equipment they wanted to keep, and the boys bought it. And they, they junked the rest or traded it and gave dad the money for what the value of the trade or whatever it sold for. And then they went to the bank after another little period. Now they owned all the equipment they needed. They owned the livestock and the bank would loan them money to buy the farm. Well, the first time they started, the bank wouldn't loan them all the money. So the dad said, all right, you do that, I'll loan you the money on this farm at 2% less than the bank was charging, but that's 2% more than I was getting at the CD of 0 0.001 or whatever it was. So, you know, he, he was thrilled. He, he doubled his 200% increase on his money. The bank was happy to loan it on that land, and the boys had a cash flow statement that made sense. So we're transitioning this, 
the key to this was situation was mom and dad were 70 when they started it. So by the time the, the boy and the, the boys were actually in their 40s, and they were coming off some on off farm jobs and some other farming opportunities to come into it. So you figure out now if that 18 year old kid is the one that's coming into farming, that's we need to look at it differently. His dad may be uh, in his, his 40s and he's going to continue farming for a few more years. So you have to make it fit the situation. But what I'm throwing out to you is there, there's all different ways to make it work. And it doesn't mean it's the, the normal way but it has to have business uh, intent that's reasonable. If not, it's gonna be determined to be gifting by the IRS. And if it's gifting, well, that may affect the, the relationship with the non-farming kid. So this inheritance strategy would be after you've died. There's a lot of these same things with the, how do we structure buy-sell agreements? Are we gonna use trust to do it? Trust can be a great tool. All kinds of ways to write a trust. There's, there's hundreds of ways to write a trust. But a big thing that I deal with in my clients is they wanna provide for their spouse and they wanna provide for their kids and they want their farming kid to have a shot because he's addicted or she's addicted. And they want the family to get along when I die. That's a big one. They want the family to get along because they've seen too many that don't. Maybe their, their brothers and sisters don't. So how you structure this could determine who comes to Thanksgiving and Christmas, right? Maybe who comes to the cemetery, I don't know. It's not clicking. I need to kick it. So there's, there's all kinds of ways to write a trust and how do we build the distribution plan within a trust to meet the family situation? So if a trust is needed, it can be, fun, it needs to maintain, to fit the characteristics of the people involved, but also maintain flexibility because what if these people's characteristics change? What if the farming kid becomes disabled? Everybody's thinking about what about 80-year-old daddy, daddy getting hurt, but what about 30-year-old son? If he gets hurt in a farm accident, now what are we going to do? What if he gets divorced? So when we're dealing with the farm, we want to deal with the, this distribution plan. This is now I'm going to die or while I'm alive or after I'm gone, how does the trust distribute the assets? Because the trust could hold an asset for, say, a farming, an example would be the farming child could get the machinery at death. But the land is going to be leased to the, the, the trust is going to hold the land and lease to the kid for 15 years. In that case, the reason why I chose 15 years is the oldest child, the, the oldest non farming child is now 50. If daddy wrote this and it triggered this, when he's sick, the oldest non-farming child, 65, the farming child now has to either make it or not because the, this oldest child deserves to have some inheritance for his retirement. Uh, how do we do buyout or rental options? Sometimes they'll say that the, the trust will own the land and the farming child will have the first option to rent it at a, at a determined price in the community. That's when you get the ag agent involved and they try not to get controversial. And then you point to farm business analysis or something and you come up with a price. And it could be to say at a discount, say 80% of whatever the, the price is normally for this type of land. Or dad, when he puts it in the trust, he gets a group of, of, of advisors and they create a price and say, okay, this is the price today. And these, seem th these, see these same three people would create the price later. So it's telling the trustee and the beneficiary, here's the people that are going to determine the price. It's not you kids. It's these friends, professionals, uh, maybe real estate, maybe bankers, whoever. They're going to come up with a price 
but I'm going to give my farming kid a 10% or 20% discount. But again, you might balance this with up until a certain period of time triggers, say it's the retirement of the oldest child. Uh, first rights of refusal or option to, uh, to buy out to the, uh, for the farming child to buy out the non-farming child. That right of first refusal and option is we build that into almost all the deeds that we do with family is I'm going to deed it to my one son, but if he ever sells it, he has to offer it back to me. But what happens is if we don't agree on a price, then he can sell it to anybody. But if he gets a price before he can sell it, he has to come to me and his other bro his brother. And if we have a certain time frame to say yes or no, because we can't hold him hostage forever. But because I gave him that land, I gave this one that land, or maybe I still kept it. So you're setting up a time frame where if, if, if they can agree on a price, great. If they can't agree on a price, they get a, a fair market price, they have to go back. And if the, kid, the brother wants to buy it, then he has to sell it to the brother. We do this with a lot of neighbors uh, that buy land uh, that are from one neighbor from the other. Uh, the neighbor that we have bought part of our farm, but if he ever wants to sell it, he has to offer it to me. If I'm gone, he has to offer it to my boys. If he's gone, his son or grandson, and luckily all of us are friends, but it stays in the neighbors or in the family first, and then it can go to the outside, but it's not holding people hostage. We have a time frame in there, usually 30 days to uh, 60 days because you have to get a, appraisals or bank approval, but you still have a time frame. Uh, so that's the right of first refusal, or first to last right of refusal. Uh, we said something about non-farm assets and non-farm and heirs. Uh, the appreciation of land, uh, how that, that asset has grown, that value of the land, maybe we can distribute some of just the appreciation, not the purchase price. We've had family members do that. Buy-sell agreements we talked about a little bit before. Uh, was that tr limits who the transfer goes to uh, so that you don't have someone, you don't make someone be a partner with somebody else that they don't want to be a partner with. Complicated, but yet you don't, you, you give it to something to your two kids and the kids want to sell it to somebody and that's his brother's arch enemy. So don't do that. Or maybe there's a, uh, the, uh, buy sell agreement allows again that kid that has it to actually sell it, but it can't be held hostage. Uh, we this when you have multiple owners or multiple owners in a single business, you better have some sort of buy sell agreement. Every business uh, operating agreement will have some sort of buy sell agreement, and usually also it has something to do with death, disability, bankruptcy. If one of the members gets, is, gets divorced, then there's a buy-sell agreement. That way the business goes on, but you two go fight a divorce court. We're going on farming. Or if one of them gets disabled, here, okay, disabled's fine, and we're gonna do this. That doesn't mean they have to throw them out, but it does structure it that, that one can't force to stay in the business if he can't contribute to a physical business. Um, the business owners and the members of the LLC or partnership can always work something out, but if they can't work it out, they got to go to that operating agreement. And that's the most important thing, why you need to have it in writing. A uh, professor always told me you should spend twice as much time in the operating agreement, twice as much space on how do you break up when you're starting out together and everybody's friends. It's just like, all, all, all partnerships will end. You know, most marriages end quite often, but they all end eventually. And that's the same way with businesses. So particularly businesses, because people's ability to work changes, their, their energy levels change. A business may not continue with the same partners all the time. A partner may leave and retire, or if uh, <clears throat> they, they die, how do we have a buyout for the widow or the other, the spouse of the deceased partner? 
Do we want my two boys to be partners with their sister's husband who they don't like? Well, that's up to them. If they want him to stay in, they can let him stay in. But if they don't like him, they're going to buy him out. And he can't argue about it because his wife signed the papers. Again, more provisions is how to trigger events, death, disability, bankruptcy, divorce. Uh, how do we value it? How do we fund the buyout? Do we do life insurance? <clears throat> but I've mentioned disability, divorce a couple of times. You better plan on it. It's one of those things that, that happens. Uh, it happens to the best of families. It happens to the worst of them. People die. People get divorced. We've, we've talked a lot about death and all this planning in earlier sessions, but the divorce and disability, a lot of people don't talk about. In the divorce, is, uh, what if you made a gift to one of the people getting divorced? Make sure you track it appropriately so it stays with the person you wanted to give it to. You know, you gift a track of land to your daughter to build a house, and first thing she does is put in a survivorship deed with her husband. What'd she just do? Gave him half. Had a neighbor that, uh, the idiot granddaughter, uh, you say that affectionately, uh, she's proven it's right over and over. Uh, I told grandma, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And she went to another lawyer, and he did it, and they gave it to the, the granddaughter and she put her boyfriend of the week on there. Guess his name was, uh, it was co-signing on the mortgage, grandma. When he split up, they weren't even married. He got half the, the land, the value of the land. Uh, what if, if the divorce is after the inheritance? Again, it's a tracking thing. If it was kept separate and not put into a joint account, that's the biggest thing that happens. How do we pass things in trust so divorce can't uh, tear the family business apart? Uh, Buy-sell agreements, the same type thing. How do we select an entity? And should the co-owners be, be the spouses of the, be the non-family spouses? Depends on the family, depends on the, the spouse. Uh, what if it's a son-in-law? Should he be in the business? Well, it depends. You know, does he really know what he's doing? Is he really contributing? Do you really like him? Maybe you don't do it now, but let them worry about it after you're dead. That's what one of my clients said. He said, I'll be gone. I'm not going to worry about it. His sons didn't appreciate about that later. Uh, the other thing is disability. And the big issue there is, is what if you have to have long-term care, nursing home or assisted living care, or somebody has to come to the house. Had a couple that I worked with uh, over the last 20 years. Their 18-year-old uh, son was in a uh, four-wheeler accident and was a quadriplegic. Well, that was going to affect a lot of what they were going to do in the rest of their farm business. Well, the kid was amazing through operations and therapy, he's still quadriplegic, but he graduated from U of L and has got a master's and has an excellent job making more money than his mom and dad usually do combined. And he's got a good looking wife too. That's why I'm always trying to be handy. Maybe my wife will stay around. But in the long-term strategy, who's gonna pay for this care? Is it gonna be the assets of the farm? Is it going to be a long-term disability plan, an insurance plan? What you might need to look at, hey, Dad, I'll, I'll join up with you, but you got to buy some insurance. But maybe the company or the partnership pays for that long-term insurance. Um, the, the difference of when you're transferring assets and you may go on Medicaid, there's a five-year look-back period. That's what that's about. Uh, Long-term care expenses can be astronomical. They can wipe a farm out in just a period of a couple of years, or they can wipe the cash out of a farm to where there's all left is the land. Uh, <clears throat> what about the spouse that's still at home and the ones in the nursing home? That's just the one there. That didn't count this one. 
what are the risks to the farm and the son's vocation if, if he's planning on this farm? Well, they have to sell the land to pay for the care. How do we deal? We're going to deal with insurance in another seminar down the road, but it'll be a while, so we're going to hit real briefly on some of these topics for you to think about. Life insurance can provide all kinds of opportunities. The way I look at insurance is wanting, needing, and affording. You may want it, you may need it, but can you afford it? Sometimes it's the other way around. You can afford it, but you really don't need it, but you think you want it. So we have to analyze that in the form of what is it going to do? Uh, if that life insurance provide for the dependents, uh, meaning the spouse or uh, uh, somebody that's living with them or minor child, while older child's farming. And again, fund a buyout. What if one of the partners gets hurt? Uh, how do we fund the heirs, the non-farming heirs and the farming heirs? Key man insurance is where the business pays for life insurance. And what that would be, would be son and father and son are farming. And if uh, the business, the entity, the LLC, the partnership, whatever the entity is, that has a deductible expense to pay that premium to, to provide life insurance if dad dies. What about if son dies? His spouse might need to have some, need that money because he's built up some assets. We buy him out with it or her out with it and she can take the assets and we can keep farming. Pay debt because what if, <clears throat> what if uh, dad dies and there's still mortgage on the farm and the son's going, oh crap, how are we going to do that? Mom, do you have any money? No. Well, if dad had just had insurance, we'd have been okay. Uh, estate settlement, eh, that's how do we balance the, the, the debts, the kids, the taxes. Big thing is you, when you look at an insurance, Insurance on young people is cheap. Somebody under 30 can get a million dollar policy pretty cheap. Uh, and it's a whole lot better than lottery tickets. Uh, so if, if you got a younger person farming, you better consider about how we can provide insurance because we can you know, buy out the spouses, the, the surviving spouse. Is he going to be able to provide for his kids or the grandkids, however it is? Insurance can be a great tool to help work out the, uh, the buyout or the distribution with non-farming children. So we got to execute a plan. And when we do something right and something works out, you know, celebrate it. We got through a good year. We didn't kill each other. Dad appreciates something a little better about son. Son appreciates mom a little more. And the daughter-in-law, maybe she likes farming a little more after this year's over. Or the son-in-law. We went to pick on the son-in-law, too. That's the last slide. And it's just 7 o'clock. Man, I was going pretty fast. What do we need to do for questions? They get first shot. Nobody fell asleep, but nobody went to the bathroom. No, he did. He looked up when he started to him. He went. Yeah, it's a great place to live if you want to be there. Well, uh huh. Okay. You might. Five-year deal or five year look back. So what you may have to do, this is where in a, in a situation where there's potential care costs involved in the future and you want to do something now and you got a five-year look back period. One way to do it, we got to evaluate that risk of can I make it to the five years? We also have, and that's all guessing, of course, but we also could, we could need to set it up. A lot of times we'll use an irrevocable trust. And what we actually do is that the, the parents gift the land to the kids and the kids put it in the trust. And the trust said, as long as mom and daddy are alive, the trust will hold the land. So the kids, we're pretending these are your two kids, two of them. 
if they get divorced or get stupid or whatever, not your fault, their own, uh, the creditors can't get the trust. They can't borrow against the trust. The trustee might be one of them or it might not, but mom and dad can still rent the house and it's usually based, you have to have a lease agreement and a rent, but the rent is usually based on property taxes and insurance, but you were already paying anyway. So it's a way to protect the land because once it transfers out, that starts the five-year clock. Well, the kids have to know the trust is here, but what if the five-year clock isn't gonna run? Let's say they make it to four years. Well, is it worth it to cover that one more year somehow? Borrowing money, investing money, selling a piece of the land if you had to, to cover the one more year to get there. So the also when we're doing that, we look at what other assets do you have? Do you have long-term care insurance? Oh, bam, you're past five years now. You're good to go. We do it. If you don't have the long-term care insurance and you can't get it now, how much other cash or insurance availability do you have? So these are all questions that we look at if the parent wants to deed it away uh, sooner than later. The kids are old enough to, yes, I want to farm, but then we'll also build in these buy-sell agreements so if the kids ever fall out or if one of them has an opportunity to go to Texas and make lots of money and live in the land of the free, goes down there, They how do we do the buyout? You all structure that ahead of time so you know what they're going to do, but they also know what they're getting into. So it, it can be done, but it's a very individualized situation of those certain criteria of how do we structure it. But I, we've done a lot of things that would make it work. Uh, just like my dad, he wanted... He, his theory was, as he retired teacher, he farmed for about five years after he retired, but he also saw that if he had kept it, the farm was going to go down. The fences were going to go down. The barns weren't going to get painted. Uh, he didn't have the money to invest into it because, to, to keep it up because he had to pay for living expenses. That's where one in the that that we call that in some ways the the English style. You buy it when you're 30 or 25 and you keep it till you die and you run it in the ground and all the barns are falling down and the, the fences are falling down and all the equipment's sitting outside and rusted and all the, the livestock's dead. You see that when you drive up and down the, every road. But now the Amish, their theory is a lot different, is generally that first oldest child has a priority but dad's going to sell when he's 50 to the kid who's 30 or 25. And then that funds his retirement, but he still may work. But what happens is they build the farm up and then the next generation builds it up a little more. The next generation builds it up a little more. That's why generally Amish, and again, this is a generality, the Amish model is the farm, the barns are always painted, the fences are always kept up because they have the energy and the slave labor children to do those things. Where the 70 year old, the slave labor outgrew them and got away. But, but you're, you're, you know, that's the point. People have got to analyze their own situation of what is my energy level to maintain the farm? Maybe I'll, I'll keep just mowing the yard, but. I can't clean the fences anymore and I, I can't get the job done like I really want to. Again, it's the, the, maybe that answer is you're talking about a hundred acres and, and junior better have a good job somewhere or the daughter may have to have a good job because they're not going to make a living properly on that hundred acres or 50 acres. But that doesn't mean you don't want to protect 50 acres because that, that's a tremendous, 50 acres can be a tremendous lifestyle that you were raised on and you raised your kids on and you can work very hard on 50 acres just like you can 500 acres. You just might have to want more kids. Can you repeat the, question? The, the question was, is, is a, as a younger, somewhat younger person, let's say in their 50s or 60s that are disabled 
or health is starting to fail, can we gift the farm now? And the answer is, well, it depends. Now, we're getting y'all trained for that. And what I told them before, that's to amaze, amaze your friends and embarrass your family. Talk like a lawyer. Okay, anybody have another question? Okay, who, who do we have? What do we hear? Yeah. Okay. Could you elaborate on creditors touching a trust given to the child inside the five-year window? Okay. In a trust where we're doing that setup where we gifted the, gifted the property and we set up an irrevocable trust, the beneficiary may be a child. Well, the trustee would have absolute discretion on distribution. And if there's no income, maybe there's no distribution. If there is income, that doesn't mean they have to distribute it. What generally means if we've distributed income to or assets to one beneficiary, you probably got to do it to all the beneficiaries. But just because, say, one child is in a divorce, well, that wasn't an inherited property. It was gifted property. Well, the in-law wasn't gifted the property. The kid was. And we make the in-law sign the deed too to give it to the trust. So they can't touch it in a divorce. Let's say the child <clears throat> is in a car wreck and they're liable and they cause somebody to get hurt. Uh, say it was a DUI or reckless speeding or something. And they sue them in civil court and it's above the insurance. Well, they could come after the assets of the child. Well, the child's a beneficiary of the trust, but the trustee has absolute discretion to distribute. As long as mom and dad are alive, he didn't have to distribute anything. So that's how it would, it would protect mom and dad. Now, the lawsuit may still be against the child when mom and dad are, the survivor is gone. Another thing is in, in setting that situation up, what if dad dies, mom's there, and later on she needs to go to assisted living? Well, maybe she can't afford it. That doesn't mean you couldn't sell the, the, the trust, couldn't sell part of the farm to the kids, even though they are the beneficiaries, but we're going to do it to structure money to the kids so that they can give money to mom to pay for long-term care. So it's a, it's a jumping around, but it's, there is flexibility just because it's in the trust doesn't mean it's locked in there forever. So inside the five-year window, I think that's what the point was. Anybody else? Okay, man, I could have been paid pretty good tonight. Uh, but the, the real thing you've got to think about in the uh, transition the farm is, is this a business that's profitable? I've had parents want to give the farm to the kid or they were going to give him the cattle and equipment and let it, and then him lease the farm. And he said, well, I couldn't make any money to pay the utilities and the rent, and the, I mean, the insurance and the rent. So he turned them down. He said, I'd rather you keep it, you pay all the bills and I'll just play on it. Is it, is it a business that the kid has the opportunity to grow it, make it more profitable or diversified or make it bigger because of his energy that the older generation is, is growing down, lacking? Uh, is it just a hobby? If it's still a hobby, it's a valuable thing. Hobbies are a valuable thing. Uh, the way we run our farm, we've got 60 acres, and uh, my wife and I own the land. The operating business, we just, uh, the boys have worked in it and had their 4-H and FFA projects. Well, uh, this year, one's 27, is 125. We gave them 20% interest in the LLC. Now, we still own 60%, but there's a buy-sell agreement. But what it amounts to is we, they understand if we make a profit, and we have been, that doesn't mean that they're going to pull it out and live on it. It means we're going to invest it and make it bigger and better and have more fun. So you, you've got to sit it to structure the situation. 
And like I said, when we make when we make more profit, what I mean by more fun is, well, last year the boys went to Texas to look at some uh, several farm operations, goat operations, pick out some potential sires to breed to and some sales to get into. So it was a business trip that's tax deductible. Yeah, so you, you but, but if they understand that one son may not work as much as the other on the farm, well, does it matter if we're not planning on taking any money out of the farm, but we don't ask them to donate into the farm. If they do, it's not a donation, it's a loan. And then the farm pays them back as soon as we sell some, have some money, they get paid back. So we're all back to equal again. So when one of them gets a wild idea of wanting to really do something, I'd say, well, how much money you got? And you know, I'm not paying you any interest. <laughs> so usually they think about it. But again, it, it's, it's, we could talk about 5,000, 10,000 acre farms where you talk 50 acre lifestyle. And for us, my wife and I, it's important for the boys, when we got our business cards 30 years ago, it says Jeffrey's Farms, raising kids is our business. And we didn't talk, we weren't talking about the goats. But, uh, but the boys learned a lot of valuable lessons because my wife and I grew up on the farm and we feel like it's the best place in the world to raise a kid. Any other question? Oh, they'll come to you in a nightmare, a dream, one. Uh, so next fall, this fall, we're going to do some more of these, and you have other speakers too. I'm not hogging them all, unless David's wife keeps feeding me, but uh, I'll keep coming. But it's the idea that we want you to really get is everybody's situation is different, and there's opportunities out there, but you need to, like we talked about in the first ones, and Clint Quarles talked about it too, is you need to get uh, advisors or uh, professionals with your taxes, your uh, borrowing, your the, the legal side, create the business plan, the estate plan, and the succession plan, those three circles. But they all are related. They all have to connect, but it has to be specific to you and your family. And the real thing you want to look at is our family right now and where are they going to be, just like that wheel talk we did was about five, ten years, three to five years when the older you get, is you've got to review that. Is that plan feasible in the future? Are we, are we doing a succession plan that just it isn't going to work ten years from now? But if it doesn't work, how are we going to set up those buy-sell agreements to, to get out of it? or to still be fair to everybody involved. Uh, I, uh oh, if child is gifted, if property is gifted into a trust to a child within the five years, the parents the gifted become sick, can Medicaid come back and claim against the property? What they'll do is it's, from the five year clock is started on the day the deed is recorded. And the five year clock is the date you, apply, not the day you go in the nursing home, but the day you apply for Medicaid. Medicaid is, is uh, there's uh, financial need and medical need. So they, if you've gifted something out on the date of the application, they go back and they say, have you made any gifts for less than fair market value within five years of today? Well, it was five years and, and two days ago you did the deed and you say, no. That's it. End of question. It's over. They go on with the application. Now, what you've got to do in setting up this trust planning is we've started the clock ticking but it's really from the date of the application back. It's called a look back period. But what we've done, we started the clock. So we know when the five year period runs, don't apply for Medicaid until the five year period is passed. So if there's that middle period, that's say six months or two years or three years, whatever it is, 
how do we cover it with something to get to the five years before we apply for Medicaid? That's why having long-term care insurance is so important because if you're at long-term care insurance pays for five years, there you go. If you have uh, other assets, you know, if you got a couple hundred thousand in CDs and you're not touching them or, or in stock investments, a retirement plan, and you got income to carry you, but if that extra care is needed, you can get that money out and not touch the land to get to the five-year period. So can they come back on it? What they do is if you go apply before the five years are up, Medicaid, the officer is going to say, oh, you get, your deed was four years ago. You gave that away. They'll, what they'll do, they'll, they'll impose a penalty period, which is the value of the gift on the date of the gift, not the date now, the date of the gift, and they divide it by a certain factor that Medicaid comes up with, and it's usually longer than the period that's left. So there's a penalty. So sometimes we have to, uh, I have had people had to redo it or put it back. Well, if you put it back, now what do you got to do? Spend it down to get to the less than $2,000. So that's a, what if the kids hopefully know better and don't apply until they know they passed the five-year window? So that's what in the planning, the kids have to learn those steps and, and red flags of, oh, if something's happened, we need to call that lawyer and double check what are we supposed to do? Have the Medicaid rules changed? That's a biggie. What if the rules have changed? So the, the answer is yes, they could come back on it, but just don't apply until you made the five year period. Any other good questions? Do y'all have any good questions? I see the wheels churning over here. <laughs> All right. If anybody wants to come off of mute right now, you're welcome to, to ask any questions as well. Um, this is going to be the last call for questions. I'd like to take this time to thank Keith for helping us with our spring trainings. Uh, this has been just uh, phenomenal. Uh, appreciate all his effort uh, driving all the way up here each week for our workshop and it's greatly appreciated. Uh, he's given us a lot to think about. Um, and as he said, when we started, he said that the main thing is start now. Don't wait. Uh, the earlier you start, the better you're going to be. And, uh, we appreciate all he's uh, shared with us. And I appreciate my coworkers that helped me with all the technical information and uh, getting me connected. Couldn't have done it without uh, couldn't you. Couldn't have done that without. So appreciate uh, Philip and uh, the ladies that helped at the other meetings as well. So, Thank you all for coming and being on, on the Zoom. And they are going to have it on so you can see it later. So if you, you were on a race, you could try it again to see what was he trying to say? He sounded real confused. Yeah. He said, but when you do, it's to start doing something. And the whole point is too many people want to think they have to come up with a plan and then go to the lawyer to write the plan and then execute the plan. It's not that way. You need to know what, who you are, what you have, and who you have. And if you got an idea of how you want it to go, that's, that's, your, that's you and your life. Then you go to the lawyer to figure out these, these are my situational issues. How do we deal with them? Because you've not done this before, probably, where hopefully the lawyer you get does it every day. Just like anything else, when you hire a professional to do it, you want to get somebody that has experience with the problem you have. Because I've had too many people think they don't call, they don't call because they can't figure out who the guardian is going to be for their kid. And this one uh, friend of mine, she, she kept, every time I'd see her, oh, I've got to get my estate planning done. One day she called, and I said, well, tell him happy birthday. 
And she said, what are you talking about? I said, your youngest son just turned 18 day before yesterday. Now you don't have to come up with a guardian. That's why you called. She goes, dang it. 